If we could take our seats and prepare for worship, hear our meditation verse for this morning from Lamentations. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. To the worship of our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our triune God. I'm glad you could all be here with us in person or online. <clears throat> um, well, I'd like to remind you all that we have an opportunity for fellowship this afternoon. After the service, there'll be a church picnic. If you forgot about it and didn't bring food, or if you're a visitor, no matter, just go on ahead and, and uh, participate and join up anyway. We're glad to have folks here. I'm sure there'll be enough for anyone anyway. Um, hear the call to worship from the Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. And we do have songs of praise. We have two songs of praise this morning. Our first will be, Hear Our Praises, and the second is, His Mercy is More. Um, his mercy is more needs a little bit of an intro, so Craig is actually going to regale us with a, with a slight intro that he's going to sing for us to help us to get started with that. Uh, so don't be alarmed when you hear him singing and you're not. Uh, please stand as we sing. Our first will be Hear Our Praises, number 36 in the White Songbook. If you happen to have one and you want to follow along with the music. <clears throat>
Heavens declare your glory, O God, and the sky above proclaims your handiwork. Your eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived in the things that have been made, so they are fools uh, <clears throat> without excuse who say there is no God. We know, O God, that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Power belongs to you, and with you nothing is possible. All authority is yours, both in heaven and on earth. You are the rock. Your work is perfect, and your ways are truth and justice, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity. You are our rock, and there is no unrighteousness in you. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God, even when your judgments are like the great deep. And though clouds and thick darkness are all around you, yet righteousness and justice are the foundations of your throne. You have proclaimed your name, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And this, your name, is our strong tower. For your merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. We pay homage to the exalted Redeemer, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. We confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We also worship the Holy Spirit, the helper, the spirit of truth who was sent to teach us all things and to bring all things to our remembrance. As we gather here and seek to draw close to you, we ask your blessing as we seek to worship you in spirit and truth. Be pleased to accept our worship and draw, close, draw us close to yourself. We pray this by the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please, please be seated. <clears throat> if you turn to your bulletins, we have a responsive reading as we're going through the book of Proverbs. Let's read God's word. There is a way that seems right to a man 
Even in laughter, the heart may ache. And the, end of the, joy may be the backslider in heart will be filled with the fruit of his ways. The simple believes everything. One who is wise is cautious and turns away from evil. A man of quick temper acts foolishly. And the, man of evil has the simple inherit folly. But the, of the evil bow down before the good. The, the poor is disliked even by his neighbor. Whoever despises his neighbor is a sinner. Do they not go astray who devise evil? Those who devise good meet steadfast love and faithfulness. Wise words from the scriptures. Our hymn of adoration this morning is O Worship the King. It's number two in the Trinity Hymnal if you're following along. Please stand as we sing. be seated. Our God calls us to agree with him that we are sinners and apart from him we are nothing. We take this opportunity now to have a, a prayer of confession. Hear the call to confession from scripture. The times of ignorance God overlooked but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. 
And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Give me an opportunity now to have a quiet time of uh, private confession, and, and then I'll lead us in a corporate prayer. Let's pray. Father, before you, we are small and powerless. How can we answer you? We'd be wise to cover our mouths with our hands so we don't make any foolish claims. Apart from Christ, we bring you nothing that you would be pleased with us. Without Jesus, we offer no evidence of faithfulness or obedience. If we claim to be in the right, our own mouth would condemn us. If we said we are blameless, you would prove us perverse. For if you contend with us, we, we could not answer you once in a thousand times. Were you to write for us your laws by the ten thousands, we would be regarded by us as, as a strange thing. And our corrupt hearts have been sometimes ready to say, What is the Almighty that we should serve him? For we have walked in the ways of our own heart and in the, eye, in the sight of our own eyes, carrying out the desires of the flesh and the mind. There is in us a tendency to turn away from the living God. Our hearts are deceitful, above all things, and desperately sick. Who can understand them? We have sought our own glory more than the glory of him who sent us, and have been arrogant concerning that for which we should have mourned. And that which is at the bottom of all is the evil, unbelieving heart in us, which inclines us to fall away from the living God. We have grieved the Holy Spirit of God by whom we were sealed for the day of redemption. You have said it and confirmed it with an oath that you have no pleasure in the death of sinners, but rather desire that we should turn and live. Therefore, we will rend our hearts, not our garments, and return to the Lord our God. For you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And we pray that our lives may bear fruit in keeping with repentance and never again turn back to folly. For what have we to do any more with idols? For sin will have no dominion over us, since we are not under the law, but under grace, grace that is brought to us by faith, faith in the redeeming power of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Our hymn of assurance, having made our confession, to God be the glory, number 55, in the Trinity hymnal, Please stand as we sing.
Please be seated. <clears throat> For our scripture readings, we're currently going through the book of Ephesians. Here, God's word from Ephesians 2. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made us both one and has broken down his flesh by the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you <clears throat> who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole scripture being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Let's take this opportunity now to uh, read the Apostles' Creed together, uh, a brief summary of what, the, what we believe the scriptures teach. Uh, we read through this periodically. It's a good thing. Please stand and let's recite the, the Apostles' Creed together. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Children ages 3 to 6 whose parents would like them to go to the Bible time are free to go there now for classroom 8. As for us, we have an opportunity for prayer. We have many things for which we can be thankful, many needs that could be addressed. And our God treasures when we bring these things before him, when we cast our burdens and cares on him. Let's go to a time of prayer. We will bless and give thanks to the Lord as long as we live. We will sing praises to our God while we have our being. And when we have no being on earth, our hope is being in heaven to be singing your praises all the much better. But as for this world, you cause the light to shine, you give us the changing season, you sustain life in accordance with your good will. Our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit, and our souls have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. We therefore glorify you with our bodies and with our spirits, which are both yours. We bless you that you were in Christ reconciling the world to yourself, not counting their trespasses against them, and that you have entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. We thank you for the gracious invitation he gave to those who are weary and heavy laden to come to him for rest, and for the assurance he has given that whoever comes to him, he will never cast out. You have, asked, you have directed us to ask and seek and knock and have promised that we will receive, we will find, and it will be open to us. We have many opportunities uh, as you have graciously allowed us to participate in your great commission to make saints of all of folks in all nations and we thank you 
that you've allowed us to participate in certain ministries, and we want to just highlight a few of those here, for we participate in many, but we thank you for the Frederick Rescue Mission and Sober House, which uh, locally here, and we give you praise that your word never returns empty, and that your graces are evident in the salvation and changed lives of some of the men. We ask that you bring many more of the recovery men to saving faith in Jesus and to lasting sobriety. We ask that you will raise up more men to be servant leaders in these ministries to men who are so often the least, the last, and left out. Father, we also pray for Roberta, and we pray that she would be able to attend to all the tasks on her to-do list as she prepares to uh, return to Japan in two weeks. We ask that she remain COVID-free, that she can be cleared to travel back to Japan. We ask your blessing on Roberta's students as she prepares to begin classes again in September. We pray for Marcus and Bethany, and we give you thanks for providing them a place to stay in Silver Spring here. We pray for their support and fundraising efforts that, and ask that you demonstrate uh, your providence by their goal of August 31st. We pray for Malachi's leg to be healed from his recent fracture. We also ask that you would give Marcus and Bethany a fruitful ministry of sharing the gospel. We also pray for Woody's full recovery from surgery two weeks ago. We pray for our uh, friends as they settle into their new home in Bogota and ask uh, for relief from headaches and fatigue caused by altitude sickness. We ask your blessing on their back to school preparations. And we also ask for safety as they learn to navigate an unfamiliar city with a language barrier. Father, we pray for our, our elected officials uh, in federal and state and local governments. We ask that you would um, cause them to govern in accordance with the principles in your word that our nation um, would be at peace with you. We pray for our upcoming uh, midterm elections. It is clear that you, it is you who establishes nations and their leaders. We ask that you would set our nation on a path of truth and justice that would honor you and we, and we continue to be free to openly preach the gospel and all that your word teaches. We pray for uh, Jim and Brooke's brother-in-law, Dan, as he has recently suffered more strokes. We pray for Dan's healing and that his heart will be open to the gospel. We ask for peace and comfort for family members as they make decisions about his living and health care arrangements. We pray for grace and healing for folks with ongoing health concerns for Sharon, Tom, Craig, Delora, Artis, as well as Rhonda's mother, Dolores, Joe's daughter-in-law, Laura, Monica's father-in-law, Bill, Cindy's parents, and Maxine's sister, Karen. We ask that you grant these things which we have faithfully asked according to your will, to the relief of our need, and to your glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'd like to invite the deacons now to come forward to collect God's tithes and our offerings.
Please be seated. Thank you, Pete. Before the sermon this morning, I want to call your attention to something that uh, we just did not too long ago right here uh, in this worship service. We had the word read to us from Acts chapter uh, 17. It's uh, the call to confession. As we read that, something struck me, and I just want to share that with you. Uh, it may not be anything new to you, but if it isn't, if it is, great. If it's not, I want to remind you of what God's Word says. Turn it to, uh, it's actually on page 4 of your bulletin, so that you can see I'm not making this up. Luke is writing here, and he writes, The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. It's that phrase that struck me. We have a picture oftentimes portrayed, uh, a picture in our, uh, in our society, oftentimes the picture is portrayed of God extending an invitation, asking us to repent. Sometimes we get the idea, the picture in our mind even, uh, of God kind of sitting in heaven, so almost wringing his hands, wondering who all is going to repent. That's not a biblical picture. I want you to see what God's word says right here. He commands. It's not a request. It's not God saying it'd really be a good idea. It'd be best for your soul. It'd be even best for your life here upon earth if you repented. No, God commands you to repent. And one of the implications of that is that when we sin, not only are we guilty of the sin and experience not the loss of salvation, but certainly a, break in, a brokenness in our relationship with God as a result of our sin. But not only do we experience that, but it, if we then refuse to repent of it, we compound that. We are sinning again because we are obeying God's direct command to repent. That struck me. I want to share that with you. And we're going to be talking about something today that is probably going to be convicting to each of us. It, has, I, I, it is to me as I prepared it. I share one point in the message where uh, uh, my conviction comes through, but I, I certainly didn't take the time to do that with everything. But I just want to uh, encourage you, as you hear what God has to say to you this morning through this poor mouthpiece, that you would have an attitude of repentance where God steps on your toes. My, my uh, desire in this is to be compassionate and understanding. Uh, one of the elders this morning prayed that uh, I would not uh, compromise or be fearful, exactly what he prayed, that I would not be fearful. And I, I, I'm not fearful of proclaiming the word, but I want to proclaim it in a way that is also winsome and is compassionate, uh, especially when I'm proclaiming it to his people. And so, um, while this uh, message this morning, it's not, it's not really that hard a message, but it is a message that I believe God will use, and uh, if we're sensitive to it, there's not a one of us that will walk out of here without saying, yeah, God spoke to me about this in my life or that in my life. So, let's enter that time with an attitude of repentance already in our hearts. Pray with me, please. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that it is sharper than any two-edged sword, that it pierces us asunder, that it, it divides even as it could marrow from bone. And Lord, that it is, but it is a purifying sword. It is a sword which brings healing and not death. And so we pray, Lord, that you would use your word to instruct us in how we ought to live. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've not already done so, please turn in your Bibles with me to the uh, letter of James, written by James. Anyone need a Bible? Everybody got a Bible that they can turn to? Good, I hope it's a paper Bible. All righty, I've got a number of reasons for that. I won't go into them. I've already shared some of them with you. We're going to be reading James from, uh, in chapter 3. Let me remind you, we're, uh, we're speaking of little foxes that spoil the vine, a, a, an image taken uh, from the Song of Solomon. 
Uh, we're talking about those things that disrupt unity in the church. You'll remember a number of weeks ago, I said the problem is not that we as a congregation or any group of people that we need to build unity as Christians. The, what really is the issue is we need to stop breaking the unity that God says we already have. And so these are disruptors of union and uh, of, this, of this unity. And today we're going to be looking at, I'm calling it a family of little foxes. Not a single thing. We've looked at false doctrine. We've looked at pride and, and singled uh, those two out. Uh, but today it's more like a family. These foxes, if you will, find their power in the spoken word, in the use of the tongue, the way we use our tongue. Listen to what James has to say about our tongues. But again, let's pray before we read his word, God's word. Father, speak to us from your word. Direct us. Order our thoughts now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So James, one of the apostles of Jesus, writes this. Not many of you should become teachers. Interesting. He gives a reason. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Hmm. Think about that. To shoulder the responsibility of teaching God's word. Whether it's here in the pulpit, which is oftentimes what we think of when we read that passage, but it can also be in a Sunday school classroom, it can be in a home Bible study. Wherever it is that we accept the responsibility of teaching what God's Word has to say, it is a heavy and an awesome responsibility. Verse 2, for we all stumble in many ways. And now he's going to talk about one of those ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man. If you've never spoken a word different from what you should have spoken, never said the wrong thing, never, James says you're a perfect man. And, if, and he's able to bridle his whole or she is able to bridle her own body, their whole body. You see, not one of us is perfect. Not one of us, even when we teach, even though I teach from a manuscript, uh, there are most times after the sermon's over, I say, ah, I didn't even read that the way I had it written. I spoke it wrongly. And just because I've got it written, even if I read it that way, doesn't mean that it's necessarily spoken properly. You need to be the judge of that. You need to be analyzing that. You need to be always saying, is that what the Scripture really says? Is Jim, is Jim spoken truly here? And so even though none of us are able to teach perfectly, I want to suggest to you that James' point here is much bigger than just teachers. He's not just speaking to preachers. He's not just speaking to Sunday school teachers or Bible study leaders. He is speaking to each one of us. And we're going to get to his point in a moment. But first of all, James gives us two examples of what he's talking about before he makes his point. Example number one, verse three. He says, if we put bits into the mouth of horses, horses, so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. With a simple piece of metal, it's about two and a half, three inches long, usually not much, finger, much thicker than your little finger, with that little piece of metal, we can, put a, um, we can put that into a horse's mouth, and we can control a one to 2,000 pound animal. Example number two, verse four. Look at ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. Regardless of the size of a ship, its direction is determined by a small device called a rudder. And without it, a ship cannot be steered in any direction. It will be blown about by the wind. It will be driven along by the currents. And whoever's upon that ship will have little to no control over its destination or course. 
So we've got horses that are take, that, that, that a small little bit controls. We've got ships that are a small part of that ship, a small uh, thing called a rudder controls. Now verse 5, we get to, Paul, uh, to James' point. He says, so also, this means like likewise, or in like manner, in just the same way. He says, the tongue is a small member. Think about that. If you were to compare the weight or the size of your tongue to the rest of your body, it's pretty small, isn't it? It's pretty tiny. The tongue doesn't weigh much. I unfortunately weigh over 200 pounds, and my tongue probably is less than a pound of that. It's a small part. Though the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. Just like the bit, just like the rudder. He continues, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small flame. How many times have we read accounts of forests that have been consumed by a fire that was started by a small campfire or maybe by a carelessly disposed of cigarette? That's the picture we're getting here. He goes on in verse 6. He says, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. And James here isn't talking about unbelievers and their tongues. You know that's true. He's talking about us. He's saying that's true for us, too. Our tongue is, the, is, is a fire. It can be a world of unrighteousness. And here's the power of that tongue. Listen to what he says, verse 6. He says, the tongue is set among our members, staining, that means soiling or contaminating, the whole body. This little one-pound thing, or less than a pound thing, can contaminate our whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set itself, means meaning in, in itself set on fire by hell. And here's the irony, verse 7. For every kind of beast and bird, every kind of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. I can't. You can't. Just like we saw with pride last week, this battle to tame, or that is to control the tongue, is an unending, lifelong battle. Oh, how I wish that it was simple. And I could say, God, please give me a tongue that's under control, and he would grant that, and for the rest of my life, my tongue would never be out of control. But it doesn't work that way. It is restless uh, uh, James writes, it is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Here's how you know that's true, verse 9. With it, he's speaking of the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father. We come here on Sunday mornings and we sing how glorious God is and we praise him and, and we worship him and, and express our adoration to him. And we do that with our tongue. And with that same tongue, I'm, it's not exactly how it's written, and with it, with that same tongue, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. I don't think James is talking about taking the Lord's name in vain here. I don't think he's talking about even using that uh, language that's not exactly cursing, but it's uh, not good language. You know, those four-letter words that we aren't supposed to use. I think he's talking about speaking, using the tongue to harm others. My brothers, he says at the end of verse 10, these things ought not to be. Talk about an understatement. These things ought not to be. And then he asks, really, some a, a series of rhetorical questions. 
does a spring, you know what a rhetorical question is? It's a question that's asked as a question, but the answer is so obvious that you don't need to answer it. It says, does a spring bring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives? Or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. That's God's word. I want to suggest to you, as it, as it fits the context of what we're looking at here in the, this morning and in this series of messages, is that the tongue, your tongue and my tongue, the tongue is often the entryway through which these little foxes that become jackals gain access to the vineyard. While these foxes, well, take different forms, they all share one thing in common. They're given entrance and they're given life by the uncontrolled use of your tongue. And once in the vineyard, once in the garden, once in the family, once in the congregation, once there, they quickly become ravenous wolves, destroying and harming the flock of God. Let me, give you, let me give you a short list of some of the ways your tongue and my tongue can become a doorway through which dissension and disunity and these little foxes that cause that can enter into a congregation. It is the tongue that is used to spread gossip. It is the tongue that is used to slander others. It is the tongue that is used to tell lies. It's the tongue that is used to further rumors. It is the tongue that is used to murmur and to complain. It is the tongue that is used to spread dissension and strife. And that's just a few. You may be able to add others. So we're clear what is meant by these terms. I'm going to take a moment. I'm not going to take long, but I'll give you a moment to take a moment and just define each of them for you so that we know what we're talking about. Gossip is defined as a casual and unconstrained conversation or report about other people, typically involving details that are not confirmed as being true. Now, there's another form of gossip, too. Gossip can be sharing things about other people that you know to be true, but you've got no business sharing, and you're not sharing it in an effort or in any attempt to solve a problem or for the benefit of that person. Gossip doesn't have to be a lie. Gossip can be true at the same time. When it's dissemination has no positive purpose. You know what slander is? Slander is making a false statement damaging to a person's reputation. Again, true or false. If it damages a person's reputation, it's slanderous. Lying, we all think we understand lying. We know that, and it's, it's the simple, at least the, uh, the active aspect of lying is the speaking of untrue statements. But you know, there's a passive aspect to lying too. It's just as much a lie when you know something you've heard or someone has said, you know it to not be true, but you allow it to stand. And especially if you allow it to stand, you allow it to go unchallenged or uncorrected if your intent in remaining silent is to further that untruth. You know how that works. You hear something about somebody who you don't really like for some reason. And you know what's been said isn't true. But rather than correct it, rather than stand for that person, rather than challenge the person who's made that uh, erroneous statement, perhaps an intentional lie, perhaps just a misstatement, you just kind of let it slide because, yeah, well, I don't really mind if that person kind of gets, they get brought down a peg or two if, if their reputation becomes tarnished a little bit. There are other ways. I won't go into them, but that's not our point this morning. 
A rumor, a rumor is just, it's a currently circulating story or a currently circulating report of undoubtful truth. It might be true, might not. Brooke asked me as I was preparing this, she said, are you going to play the song Rumor Mill? Have you ever heard the song Rumor Mill? Uh, it, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a Bill Gaither type song. I'm not sure who wrote it, but it's a Bill Gaither type song. Uh, and it talks about a rumor mill. And one of the lines in that goes something like this, that it really doesn't matter whether it's true or not. When the rumor mill gets a hold of that thing, they'll just fix it up the way they want it so they can pass it on. That's what rumors are. It's like whisper down the lane. Mumbling, well, sorry, murmuring, is a mumbled or private expression of discontent. You know, those who murmur seldom bring their discontent or their complaint out into the open. It's almost always done behind closed doors in whispered and secret conversations, seldom confronting the individual or maybe the situation about whom they're murmuring. And in murmuring, complaining like that, they become spreaders of dissension and strife. Dissension just means quarrels, arguments, discord. Did you know that dissension, the spreading of quarrels and arguments and discord, is of such a serious nature that Paul writes these words to Titus. You'll find it in Titus 3.10. He says, as for a person who stirs up division." It's the ESV. It could be translated as for a person who causes dissension. After warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Those who bring division and dissension are to be warned, warned a second time, and then they're to be set off. They're to be disciplined. We'd have nothing to do with them. And strife? Well, we all think we know strife. Strife, strife is just, simply, the definition for it is vigorous or bitter conflict, discord, or antagonism. Those are some of the things that the tongue has the power to do, and that's not meant to be a complete list. In your tongue you have the ability to bring tremendous disunity within this congregation, or for that matter, within your, local, within your immediate family, within your extended family, or within any group to which you belong. Is it any wonder that James wrote early on here, back in verse 5, he wrote, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Is it any wonder that when you look, you know, when I was preparing this, I, 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 I literally could not handle the number of verses in Scripture when I typed in these, some of these words, gossip, slander, uh, uh, backbiting. That's one I didn't even touch on. But when I typed in the, some of those words, uh, the list of Scriptures that deal with those, I, it, it filled my screen, pages of them on my screen. My original intent was to kind of do a survey of them. I said, I won't preach a sermon for three months if I do a survey of all these. Is it any wonder the Bible warns us over and over and over again about the misuse of the tongue? I want to look at just one of those statements today. It's one with which you're very familiar. Uh, you don't have it in printed form. It's not on the screen because there's no screen above me. So please turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Paul has been given here a, been giving a series of injunctions on how we should live, instructions on how we're to live. And as he's doing that, in the, in the midst of that, he is led by God to include these words, beginning in verse 29 of chapter 4 in the letter to the Ephesians. Paul says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were uh, sealed for the day of redemption. 
Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. You can find these same sentiments elsewhere in the scripture. I'm not saying this is the only place. But what I do want to say is that at here, these four verses give us God's solution, if you will, to dealing with our tongue. How are we to control this small instrument that can set the, can set the whole world ablaze, can set our whole life aflame? God gives us some answers. And he includes here two put-off, put-on statements with a rationale for them in the middle. Now, in case the idea of a put-on, put-off is that's new to you, if you've not heard that, that phraseology before, let me just give you a quick a quick explanation of it. Almost always in the Bible, uh, when you are told to stop doing something, that's the put off. Stop doing this. Almost always you will find uh, in, the, in that immediate context, maybe not the next words, but in the immediate context, you will find a put on, something you are to start doing in its place. That's why many of our good-intentioned and sincere efforts to stop committing some sin end in failure. Because we skip the put-on instruction. We try to do the put-off, you know, stop lying, stop stealing, stop swearing, stop drinking, stop, stop, stop. And we forget, well, we may not forget, we just don't put on, speak the truth in love, uh, earn a living, uh, praise God, or be filled with the Holy Spirit. There's always a put-on. There are two of these put-ons and put-offs here. The first one appears in verse 29. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths. What's corrupting talk? Well, the, word, the, the Greek word means rotten. Let no rotten words come out of your mouth. Rotten talk means putrefied. No longer fit for use. Worthless. This is, don't let those th words come out of your mouth. And that certainly includes at least, if not, it probably includes more, but it includes these little, this family of little foxes we're looking at this morning. And it's important to see that this is not a suggestion. James, I mean, Paul, we're in, in, uh, we're in Paul now in Ephesians, um, writes it as a command. It is in the imperative. It is do not allow your tongue to speak words of strife, discontent, rumor, lies, slander, gossip. You have that control. But wow, that's a tall order, isn't it? That's a tall order. It's so enticing, is it not? To listen to others complain and murmur, especially if it's about those things that we're a little bit upset about ourselves. You know, the pastor said something or did something, the elders did this or something, or something happened in the church, and we get home, and somebody calls us up, and uh, we're already a little bit upset about it. We didn't like the way it was handled or what somebody said. And a person calls us up, and they start telling us how upset they are. Oh, it, 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 it feels good, doesn't it, to find out, oh, I'm not alone. I'm not the only one that feels like this. And so we entertain that gossip, that discontent, that, uh, that spreading of strife. Or it's tempting to listen to some little tidbit of information about another person. I think one of the reasons that's so tempting is because when we hear something, one of those little tidbits that's negative about another person, it makes us feel a little bit better because we're not like that. And once we've listened, oh, the compulsion to pass it on. It's a strong compulsion. God doesn't simply tell you here, lock up your mouth, 
You remember that, that little symbol with all kids? Lock up your mouth, throw the key away. That's not what he says. He gives you a replacement activity. Look at what he says. He says, instead of speaking those things that are corrupting, you are to speak only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Please notice the criterion is not whether what you've heard or what you're about to say is true or not. Sometimes we think if something is true, then we have the obligation to broadcast it to the entire world. That's not the criterion here. God doesn't say, you know, uh, you're only to speak such a word as is true. No, he says you're to speak a word that builds up others and gives grace. So what you may want to say might be very true, but if it does, does not build up and give grace, keep it to yourself. Now, I said I was going to confess. This is an area that I, I've got to confess. I'm brought up short every time I read this because for me, I find it very easy to be sarcastic. How about you? And it's, that's not a word before us today. But I want to tell you, sarcasm, even if it's conveying truth, seldom, if ever, builds up or gives grace. I mean, you get me talking about some of the things that are going on in our world today, and I can be as sarcastic as any political cartoon you'll ever read but does absolutely nothing to build up. It does absolutely nothing to give grace. Paul says you're to speak only that which builds up and gives grace. So if your words don't do that, keep them to yourself. And then talk to the Lord about your attitude, where those words come from. And there's strong motivation for this. Look at the next verse, verse 30. It begins with the word and. It means if, 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 you, if, if you don't do what I'm saying, if you, if you don't speak words which uh, build up and give grace, you're going to be grieving the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption to allow corrupting words to escape, to escape your lips. Do you, under, do you catch the significance of that? It grieves the Holy Spirit. It's not just a matter of what it does within the congregation or within the family or whatever that group may be. It's not just a matter of congregational unity. That I'm, it's not the reason I'm preaching this message. It is a matter of personal spiritual health. Your relationship with the Holy Spirit who has sealed you, your relationship with Jesus who has died for you, your relationship with the Father who has chosen you for his own is diminished, it's harmed, it's tarnished. When you speak words of gossip, slander, and the whole list that I've given, Brothers and sisters, my concern is, yes, for the health of this congregation. That's one of the reasons you've asked me to come here in this time. But I've got a greater concern than that, and that's for your personal health, your spiritual health. And so while what I'm preaching applies to the congregation, and if we as a congregation cease ever speaking those words, that will be healthy for the congregation. It's far more important to me, and I believe far more important even to the Lord, that it will be better for your spiritual health, too. If you don't, your fellowship not only with each other, but with him is hindered. Well, now we come to the second put-off. He says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger, those are the roots of these sins of the tongue. Do you see that? These sins of the tongue... If you, if you trace them back, nine times out of ten at least, they will find their root in bitterness, wrath, or anger over something. 
Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Malice? That's just like wanting to see somebody else get what you think they deserve. (laughs) That's wishing evil for another person. Wishing bad things upon another person. Put it away. Instead, here's the put on, verse 32, be kind to one another. Tenderhearted. Now, I want you to notice there's a progression here. We can be kind even to those we don't like. We can be kind even to those who have hurt our feelings. We can be kind even to those who we've spread gossip about. Or maybe those who we know have spread some gossip about us. We can be kind because that's an action. But these get progressively deeper. Be tender-hearted towards them. Oh, wait a minute. Now you're getting kind of personal, Lord. I can fake being kind, but it's a little harder to fake being tender-hearted. That gets to my motives. That gets to my attitude. That gets to how I really feel about that person. And he goes on, forgiving one another. Now, wait a minute, God. Now you're really meddling. You're telling me I've got to forgive this person? I can be kind to them. I can even try to be tender-hearted, but forgive them? for what they've done to me, what they've said about me, how they've mistreated me? Come on, God. Forgive them? I think he drives the stake home as God in Christ forgave you. Ouch. Double ouch. Ouch. That means, in case, you have, in case you've missed it, that means stop the gossip, the lying, slandering, rumor spreading, murmuring, strife. Stop all that. And instead, practice. Because it takes practice. It doesn't come easily to us. That's why we need to do it in the power of Christ. Practice being kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving. Our Father himself is your example. He is kind to you. He's tender-hearted to, towards you, forgiving towards you. He speaks not a harsh word to you or about you. He listens to none of Satan's accusations about you. He speaks to you only those words which will build you up. Yeah, even if they're tough to hear. I'm not saying it's always going to be easy what he has to say. It's not going to always be easy to listen to what he has to say. Sometimes they're tough. Sometimes we're hurt. But he's only doing it to build you up. In his letter to the Romans, Paul gives insight into the only way that you can do what is is being required here. He tells us in Romans 13, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. I'll bet 99% of the time we read that our thoughts immediately go to some sort of sensual, either sexual or some other bodily uh, gratification. We're not to make provision for the flesh to gratify its desire, so we're not supposed to indulge in sexual immorality. We're not supposed to indulge in, um, in, in, in gluttony. We're not supposed to indulge in, um, you know, and even, yeah. I hesitate to say it, but I think it's sometimes true. Uh, we're, not even, we're not even supposed to indulge in uh, athletic ap- activity, uh, physical uh, training, uh, simply because it makes us feel good or because it makes us feel healthier, because it releases whatever those things, they are, whatever the stuff is that it releases when we exercise. How there is... 
there's so much in my life, has been for years, and I confess I, I still don't have it under control, but there is so much that I do that's designed to gratify me. It may not be a fleshly kind of thing. It may be having, having to do with my own image of myself, my own self, my protection. We're to make no provision for the flesh. Gratifying its desires. And if you're to make, so if you're to make progress in this ongoing battle with this, this battle with your own tongue, you've got to put on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh. And I'm going to close with just a few suggestions to how you might do that. These are not inspired by God, although I think that they are appropriate. I think that they have, there's a biblical basis for them, nor are they meant to be exclusive. But certainly one of the things you can do is to daily ask God to guard your speech and set a watch before your lips. Just as you may on a regular basis every morning ask him to guide your steps through the day, ask him to give you strength, ask him for protection uh, as you travel, all of those things that we ask God for in advance, start including on that list each day asking him to guard your speech and to set a watch before your lips so that you do not speak any of those corrupting words. And then I'm going to become really practical. Not that that one's not practical. I just want to become very, I want to become pointed. That's a better word than practical. If someone begins to share with you something that violates the instructions that we've just read, politely refuse to listen. Say, I'm not, you know, if, if you've got a problem with so-and-so, go talk to so-and-so. Don't tell me about it. I'm not going to solve the problem for you. Don't tell me about it. And if they insist, or if some, it may be a different situation, if, when someone insists on sharing inappropriate information with you, here's what I would suggest you do. You say, and I'm going to pick on Jerry for the moment, not because, not because Jerry's ever done this. I'm going to say, Jerry... You, you tell me what you want to tell me, but I want you to know, before you tell me, that I'm going to go to whoever you're talking about, and I'm going to verify with them whether what you're telling me is true or false, and I'm going to let them know where I received this information from. Uh, most times, people at that point will say, well, wait a minute, maybe I just won't tell you. Because they're, they don't want, they're, they're, the reason they're telling you is because they don't want the other person to know what they're thinking or how they've been offended. And I can guarantee you, I think, my guarantees aren't worth that much, uh, but I think I can guarantee you that you only have to do that once or twice and nobody's going to come and gossip to you anymore. That doesn't mean you won't be a gossip. You've still got to control your tongue, but you won't be having people coming and talking to you about it. Finally, make it a practice to believe the best about others rather than the worst. I remember when I first heard the news about Ravi Zacharias. I didn't believe it. I could not believe that of him. I had met the man. I had, I had, heard, his, I had, had heard him preach and teach. I would followed his career for years and years. And he, he was one of the best... Uh, defenders of, uh, of the faith that I'd ever seen, the best, one of the best apologists. I couldn't believe it. I didn't want to believe it. I only believed it when the evidence became overwhelming. Why then am I so willing so quickly to believe that something, uh, something negative that someone tells me about Ken Sheffield? Why? Nobody's told me anything about, negative about you, Ken. <laughs> we need to make it a practice to believe the best about others. There may be other ways that you devise for putting on the Lord Jesus and making no provision for the flesh. 
But as you continually rely upon the power of the Holy Spirit, the one that dwells within you, I think you can expect to see progress in not allowing corrupting talk to come from your lips. And while it would be nice if we could come to the point where it never crosses our lips, I think in this life, because we're still a work in progress, we need to be willing to settle and to give thanks when we see that we're making progress and not condemn ourselves because we haven't gotten to the end of our life yet or we haven't been made new and given new bodies. You know, you know, one of the things about new bodies, just happen to think of this, one of the things about getting a new body is we'll get new lips, we'll get a new tongue. And a tongue that will not be as described here. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the love you have for us. Lord, we confess to you that we're far from perfect. And when it comes to this issue of the tongue, Lord, we too readily allow our tongues to be used to speak corrupting words rather than speaking those things which build up and give grace. Make us instruments, Father, we pray, of those who build one another up and those whose speech always is, la is laced with grace and gives grace to all those who hear. For we ask it in the name of our risen and mighty and powerful Savior, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand with me as we sing together our concluding hymn. We've been, we've been uh, looking at God and what he's uh, requiring of us. Now, as we sing this hymn, I just want to uh, encourage you to, be, uh, to rest assured in how faithful he is to do all that he has promised to do in and for and through each one of you. Let's sing to God about his faithfulness.
your benediction. Amen. Great is, thy, is his faithfulness. Uh, service is over. We're going to ask, let me see if I got it right, Ken. We're going to ask if all of you would move to this side of the room. Uh, we're going to set this side of the room up for the picnic that's to follow. If you came this morning, forgot there was a picnic, came not knowing there was a picnic, are visiting with us this morning, brought food, didn't bring food, it does, none of that, you're all invited. We want you all to stay and want you all to just have a time of fellowship together. So kind of move to this side of the room to do your visiting uh, or out into the hallways, whatever, but uh, they're going to set the other side up. And when that's set up, uh, we'll have the, bear, the burgers and dogs cooked and we'll have a word of prayer and then we'll eat together. Thank you.